Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. One of the most mind-boggling discoveries in the history of astronomy just became public. Apparently, life is possible on Mercury. There are regions of the planet that are indeed habitable. How could this possibly be true? This is the most unlikely planet where you could imagine to find life. It's crazy hot and crazy cold, bathed in crazy amounts of radiation. Have these astronomers finally lost their minds? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon once again. Welcome to The Angry Astronaut here in a hotel room in Denver, just outside of the airport, waiting for my flight back to Great Britain. However, it seems that I will be coming back in about three and a half weeks, hopefully, to cover the launch of Vulcan Centaur. If that's something you guys would like to support, all the details are in the description on a back beyond Patreon, PayPal, or any other way that you guys would like to support that particular endeavor. Okay, let's Let's move on to other topics, or rather, probably one of the most shocking things that I have heard in the field of astronomy for quite some time. Yeah, that even includes things about aliens. The whole notion that there might be life on Mercury. Now, this is an astonishing revelation, and it runs completely contrary to common sense. Mercury is absolutely bathed with solar radiation. It's insanely hot. Well, at least on one side of the planet. On the other side, it's insanely cold and enormous amounts of radiation on top of everything else. Virtually no atmosphere whatsoever. How could life possibly exist? Well, it turns out that there is a limited region of the planet where there's not only water, but other conditions necessary that could theoretically be favorable to bacterial life at the very least. And if it turns out that this is actually true, well, it indicates that there could be life virtually everywhere in the solar system, which is something that I have believed actually for many years. I think that as we venture out into the solar system and as we actually really start looking for life, because the Viking spacecraft was the only NASA mission that had a life detection experiment on board. By the way, it came out with a positive result. If you want more details on that, I have a link at the end of this video. But if life exists on Mercury, it could exist anywhere, and I think we are going to find that life is as universal a thing as gravity. Interestingly enough, there's actually quite a few popular misconceptions about Mercury. First of all, the planet is not tidally locked with the Sun in the same way that the Moon is tidally locked with the Earth. It rotates at a speed that gives it three rotations for every two revolutions around the Sun, giving it a day that's 176 days long, which is the equivalent of more than two Mercury years. What that means is, there there isn't a side of the planet that is constantly bathed in sunlight and another side that's perpetually in darkness, although the two sides do remain in darkness and sunlight for a considerable period of time, the planet does rotate in relation to the sun once every 176 days. That means that every part of the planet is subjected to the searing heat of the sun along with freezing cold. That is to say, except the poles, because Mercury has virtually no axial tilt, which means that the poles remain almost perpetually in shadow. The sun is barely visible at the poles, which means that there are cratered regions of both the North and South Pole that are always in shadow, and therefore safe havens for water ice, just like the moon. And by the way, what you're watching right now is a combination of an animation and actual photographs from the NASA Messenger mission, which orbited Mercury from 2011 until 2015 and was actually responsible for finding that water ice at Mercury's poles. Oh yeah, and a hell of a lot of other things as well. Now, some of the discoveries are pretty obvious, things we've known for quite some time. For one thing, Mercury is the smallest planet in the solar system. Well, that is to say, after we removed Pluto from being 
being a planet, which I still very much resent, but nevertheless, we don't have to talk about that. It's approximately 4,876 kilometers in diameter, making it about as wide as the continental United States and only slightly bigger than Earth's moon. Mercury is also a very fast planet in terms of its orbit hurtling along at about 47 kilometers per second, orbiting the Earth every 88 days, faster than any other planet in the solar system. And also, the orbit is extremely elliptical. It gets as close as 47 million kilometers to the Sun, but as far away as 70 million kilometers from the Sun. Very big variations in its orbit, so a very strange planet in many respects. Another popular misconception, Mercury is not the hottest planet in the solar system. Venus is actually hotter because of its thick, insulating CO2 atmosphere. If you need an example of a runaway greenhouse effect, Venus is definitely it. Runaway CO2 creates tremendous amounts of heat, so much heat, in fact, that even though Mercury is millions of kilometers closer to the Sun, it's not actually hotter than Venus. Also, in sharp contrast to all scientific expectations, Mercury has a magnetic field and an active metallic core. Its core is actually substantially larger than Earth's metallic core, at least in relation to the planet. It's 3,600 to 3,800 kilometers wide, which is about 75% of the planet's diameter. To put things into perspective, Mercury's outer crust is only about 500 to 600 kilometers thick and you get right into the core after that, and we have no idea as to why that's the case. The core has much more iron in it than any other planet in the solar system. Now, unsurprisingly, Mercury does have the thinnest atmosphere of any planet in the solar system. Actually, it's called an exosphere, doesn't really qualify as an atmosphere, and it's comprised of oxygen, sodium, hydrogen, helium, and potassium. However, there's another very strange thing about Mercury. It actually has streams of particles sloughing off its surface, much like a comet. Now, again, we have no idea as to why this happens, but we do have some theories. We believe that the sodium in Mercury's exosphere glows as a result of being excited by light from the sun. Sunlight also frees these molecules from Mercury's surface and pushes them away into space. But once again, we're not entirely certain that that's the case. But now it's time to get ready for one of the weirdest discoveries that I have ever seen. And the best place to look for an Earth parallel for what this discovery is, we have to go to the Zagros Mountains of Iran, where we will find something called a salt glacier. Look at these things. I mean, it's hard to believe that these glaciers actually exist. Now on Earth, these salt deposits are produced when tectonic forces squeeze the salts into plumes that rise to the surface, where the salt then slowly flows downhill. However, on Mercury, they're formed when impacts expose underlying salt deposits on the crater walls or in the crater's central peak. This is according to a planetary scientist named Alexis Rodriguez at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and the lead author of a paper about the subject in the Planetary Science Journal. The salt then flows away from the newly formed cliffs, producing glaciers that can be seen in images from the NASA's Messenger spacecraft, which orbited Mercury, as I said before, from 2011 to 2015. But where did this salt come from? Salts are volatile, meaning that once exposed on the surface, they gradually evaporate, creating what are called small hollows that pockmark the glacier's surfaces. And by the way, we've seen evidence of these hollows on Mercury as well. Scientists had long thought that super hot and relatively low gravity Mercury had lost all of its volatiles into space very early in its history. However, the presence of these salt glaciers proves this theory wrong. 
The answer, according to Rodriguez, is still being looked into, but one strong possibility is that some of primordial Mercury's volatiles escaping from its interior got trapped in what's called a mega regolith, a layer of broken rock created by repeated impacts from meteorites. When the mega regolith got capped by a layer of fine-grained material, it effectively sealed them in. And then later on, some major cataclysm, perhaps volcanism, for example, broke the cap and released those gases all at once. So according to Rodriguez, you have a gradual process of accumulation, then a very sudden release. So with these discoveries comes a new habitable zone. Close to the core, but not too close, you have the potential for enough heat to turn the ices of mercury into liquid water. And this is combined with these incredibly prevalent salt deposits and also the presence of caves to create a subsurface habitable zone at the poles of mercury, where you have salt, you have liquid water, and you have the right temperature to create a habitable zone and an ideal ideal place for life to evolve, at least in bacterial form. And who knows, multicellular life may also be possible in these caves, as long as the temperature is correct, as long as there's liquid water, and as long as there's salt deposits, you have everything you need for at least simple types of life to thrive. Now, of course, we don't know anything about the presence of organic molecules or anything else that might suggest the presence of life on Mercury. And sadly, we're not going to be landing anything on the surface of Mercury to confirm the existence of such things. However, the European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo mission is already conducting flybys of Mercury right now. Soon, this collaborative mission between ESA and the Japanese Space Agency will enter into Mercury orbit, and they have 16 scientific instruments between them. Some of these instruments are spectrometers designed to detect composition. Now, this may not be able to pick up all of the evidence that we would require, but nevertheless, it may give us a little bit more information as to the chemical composition of Mercury's regolith, and perhaps it might pick up some telltale evidence of the types of chemicals that we associate with life. Although this is sort of an outside chance, you usually have to have a surface probe to pick up that kind of evidence, but nevertheless, it's an exciting prospect, and it also presents an interesting new development in the search for life in the solar system. We need to stop looking at habitable zones in terms of the distance from the sun, but rather in the depth beneath the planet in question as well, as we have found in the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, as also have been found in asteroids such as Eris, or dwarf planets as we call them now. It's very possible that there could be habitable zones at varying depths beneath the surface of any given planet. And we may find as we expand out into the solar system and actually really start looking for life, that life is far more present and far more universal throughout the cosmos than we ever thought possible. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and please subscribe. It's so important to the growth of my channel. And once again, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find all the details in the description and as always stay angry about space